Thank you everybody for coming, and uh, we're ready to get started. Um, so, we'll start with the orbit for the thing. Orbit. Okay. Orbit, sorry. Orbit. <laughs> I really didn't know what that word meant. Obituary. Orbit. I'm going to stress my knees. Okay. This bubble word. Hello. I just bubble word. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you guys for coming. Um, so, Eleanor Cecile Walker Traverse was a beloved mother, grandmother, and friend. She passed away peacefully on December the 20th, 2023, at the age of 88. She leaves behind a legacy of laughter, love, and unforgettable Southern charm. She was married to my father from 1959 until 1983. She had two children, myself and my brother Glenn. He passed away last year. She had three grandchildren, Sam, Jaron, and Shani, and 10 siblings, Alvin, Emery, Richard, Jr., Merle, Jerry, Jean, Mary, Ruth, Jimmy, and Sue. And Aunt, Aunt Sue is our last remaining sibling. She was born in Napoleonville, Louisiana, and raised in Ponchatoula, Louisiana. Mom was a true Southern mother through and through. Her quick wit and infectious sense of humor could light up any room, and her Southern drawl could charm most anyone. She was, she was undeniably Southern because she worried about certain things. <laughs> she worried about us getting enough to eat, so she spoiled her grandkids frequently with unlimited pancakes. She worried it was too cold, so she would call me in the morning with the weather report. She worried about my hair and what I wore. She worried about my mothering, my home, and my yard. She didn't just worry, she would help. She took care of my kids, she worked in my yard, she cooked, she cleaned for us, she brought me new tea towels. I could go on. She worried about Anthony's work. She worried I left work too late. She worried about my brother. I know her worry came from a place of love. I know she loved me, my little family, and my brother. But I have to say, sometimes it was just funny. <laughs> sometimes she would warn me that if I did not send Anthony off looking attractive in the morning and greet him at the end of the day with some <laughs> she and I were on the phone one morning and she began to tell me that I needed to buy some better night gowns. <laughs> I asked her what she meant. She told me my night grounds basically were not nice enough, is what she said. <laughs> I kept trying to figure out what she meant. I kind of knew. <laughs> and um, so finally I just ended it with, I said, you know, Mom, I just to let you know, so you're not worried. I said, Anthony and I, we have a lot of sex. <laughs> <laughs> well, she did have her hearing aid on that <laughs> So she said, what? <laughs> and I said, and granted, nobody was home but me. I said, sex. <laughs> what? I said it louder. Sex. <laughs> she said what again? I said sex, Mom. S-E-X. Anthony and I have a lot of sex. <laughs> and then she said, oh, Dana, I wasn't talking about that. <laughs> Her kitchen was a place of magic where she effortlessly whipped up mouth-watering food in record time after a long day at work. I mean, she literally worked a full day, drive from 
downtown Houston come home and could make homemade chicken fried steak, mashed potatoes, and green beans in less than an hour. <laughs> but by effortless and magical, I mean she did it without measurements and without directions. <laughs> Anthony learned this once when he attempted to make me gumbo for our first year together for my birthday. Um, he called her asking for directions. And her directions included things such as, well, you make your rice, you put it in a pot, and you put water in it up to your knuckle, your second knuckle. <laughs> I like tomatoes in mine, so you get you a can, and then you pour those in, and then you take that can, and you fill it up three times with water, and then you pour that in. My husband is an engineer. He needs better directions. So after using too large of a pot for the rice and using his knuckle and not hers, and a 32 ounce can of whole tomatoes, we had something, but it wasn't good. <laughs> Mom was a dedicated employee who approached her work with an interest in people. She kept her aisle and space clean, just like her home. She excelled at customer service. She received Employee of the Year at Home Depot. She worked there for over 20 years and did not quit until she was 81. We all enjoyed her stories from her work. Her nickname at work was Security. <laughs> because she bravely approached anyone trying to steal. <laughs> Above all else, Mom was funny, and she loved to laugh. She had great timing up to the very end. Um, and expressive, her face would tell you how she felt if words failed her. <laughs> These and many more are some of my best memories with my mom. But we had challenges just like any mother or daughter. I think some conflict came from the fact that she was from a small, tight-knit community in South Louisiana, and now she was raising a daughter in the suburban sprawl of Houston, Texas. Her talents were domestic, and mine are academic and existential. <laughs> I know I was loved even with these conflicts, there were some other conflicts as well, but those are more painful for me. I'd like to honor my mom today by turning the things that she sometimes worried about into my worry at times. But I want to turn my worry into trusting God and His goodness and His provision, not only just for my eternal life, but for my life today, today I remind myself of his good gifts. My husband, my children, my profession, my friends. And I want to exchange worries about these gifts and to trust. I want to love God with my whole heart, mind, and strength, which will leave little room for worry. I really want to say in these last years in taking care of her, I want to thank my cousins. I don't have I don't have a sibling anymore. But I have you guys. If you've listened to me. My Aunt Sue specifically. I can so lean on her. My Anthony, my sweet dear children. And my friends who have helped me in the care of my mom in these last years. I couldn't have done it without y'all. Okay, we're going to have a song. You have sheet music. I know where most of y'all were raised, but I know y'all know how to sing along if you want to. Okay. Oh, introduce Dave.
Stole my paper. <laughs> oh, it's gonna be long. <laughs> I've got uh, two sets of uh, hello, hello. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. I've got two sets of uh, earplugs. Uh, Twenty dollars a pair. Uh, if you just want to hear half of what I got to say, I'll sell you one. <laughs> I'm a larking girl, okay? <laughs> I won't tell a lot about Aunt L, but I do want to talk about where she is, where she's going. Uh, faithful, funny, and feisty. Is that it? Yeah. Okay, I got that right. Well, that's for you to say. I'm not going to talk about that. <clears throat> she sure loved her family. She spent most of her energy taking care of them. I wonder she had enough time to do the life that she may have planned in the first place. I wonder sometime about the fairness of life. When you start to get, shall I say, our age? <coughs> well, Robbie's age. Uh, Robbie and Moses. <coughs> you, you think about that. Uh, I'm just now getting to the place where I'm understanding the life a little bit. I'm, and I'm getting to the place where I was thinking I really could use a, a couple do-overs. Mm. I could use a couple more lifetimes to do some stuff I would like to get, like to got done in this one. I'm about done now. I can't, 
even though it seems like I'm going to go on forever today. <laughs> uh, I'm about done. I sure would like a do-over. As I prayed about this and I thought about it and pondered, uh, <laughs> strange scripture came to me and a strange word, and it was repent. I heard that word a whole bunch. Uh, <laughs> No, thank you for not testifying here. <laughs> a lot of times it had to do with stuff I needed to, to change and needed to do. It had, a lot of times it was stuff other people thought I needed to do. I've always had a lot of wonderful folks that have always told me things I needed to repent. I didn't necessarily think I did, but anyway, they were they were good at it. But let's let's look at a scripture, John chapter, a Mark chapter one, verse fourteen. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Uh, the time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Uh, we've heard that word repent. Usually with a tuck head in... Does anybody not know what the tuck head is? <laughs> it's that guilty look that uh, Danny and Robbie... Rodney. Rodney goes around with all the time. <laughs> uh, we've heard it. And, and Jesus, I'm sure, was talking to some folks that needed to uh, turn around and change direction. But he was also talking to some mighty fine folks that had spent all of their life keeping the rules in detail. Some mighty fine folks. They were even considered righteous. And Jesus is telling them to repent. So what, it, what does that mean? Oh, as I get into it, it really starts to excite me that repenting means to get a different mindset, to get a different way of thinking, to get a better way of thinking. And people that do any counseling at all know that a different way of thinking is a different way of living. And, and I can see Jesus here. If you ever get a chance and you hadn't seen it, watch that movie, uh, the, that series, The Chosen. Ah, you get to see Jesus doing stuff. And... And I start to see Jesus as he's sitting here talking to these people. And he's sitting here with this big old grin on his face. And he's so excited about it. He just can't only contain himself. He said, I got some great news to tell you. The kingdom of God is near. It is happening. God is breaking in the scene. And is going to do something so fabulous. It's going to blow your socks off. Well, they didn't have socks back in that day. It's going to blow your socks off. And it's going to excite you and give you a brand new way of thinking and living if you'll trust me. If you'll trust me. He said, so you'll trust me. I'm going to die on the cross for you. But in three days, I'm going to come back to life. I hope you believe me. I hope you believe it. So what was this new, new thing that he was talking about? This new new life that he was talking about. Uh, first off, it was uh, God is bringing the heaven experience to earth. We all sing when we all get to heaven and we all think about how great that's going to be, but nobody's lined up to go. <laughs> and there might be something to that because God created this earth for us. And he created us to love it. Look around. Does it? Somebody's had some time and did some work and enjoys it. Y'all hadn't moved. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy it every time I get to come. I just it just just delights me to see all these things that are going on here. It's beautiful. Why? Because God created it for us and He made it for us, and man messed it up. So God's going to bring the heaven experience. Not, he don't want us to go away there. He wants us to come here. New way of thinking. New way of thinking. And then He wants God with us. God with us. In Matthew chapter 1, I believe it is, the angel said His name should be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted means God wants to come down here and live with us. He had waited a long time. He had waited until the creation of man to happen. I don't know how long he waited. You, you can go billions and billions of years, but they say it started at, at, at one time. They said that whole thing started at one time. So there's got to be a cause. 
I believe it was God did it because he wanted to fellowship with his people. And he fellowshiped with Adam and Eve in the garden and then they messed it up and kind of, you know, it didn't have, they lost faith and didn't trust him. And God didn't actually get to come back and walk and talk on earth until Jesus came and walked and talked with him. Now, this is something new to think about, isn't it? This is something exciting that God himself came and he was enjoying walking around those guys and living with them and the walking, teaching and helping and building and all this wonderful stuff. He's enjoyed it more than they were. And that's why he came. Uh, he went away, yeah, we know, but he says, I'm going to come back. John 14 says, I am with you, but I will be in you. Jesus can only be with a few at a time. God's Spirit, Jesus' Spirit, can be with all of us, anybody that wants Him all of the time. 24-7. Change His life. New way of thinking. Repenting. God with us. Ah, he, God brings stuff with him. He brings, <laughs> he, he brings, he brings his suitcase full of stuff with him when he moves in, and and the first thing he brings is uh, the love, and that love takes care of the hate. Wouldn't it be a great world? John Lennon kind of got an idea. He he didn't get it all right, but he had the idea. Imagine all the people living life in peace. Wouldn't it be great if there were no hate in the world? It's going to be that way. And, and, and he says, now you can live with love. Now I will replace your sorrow and your heartbreak with, with joy. I'll replace all the war with peace. All the family war, all the job war, all the sibling war, all the kinfolk war, Robbie. <laughs> I'll replace it with peace. That's a new way of thinking, isn't it? That's something to repent for. I, and then, and then I'll, 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 all the resentment, I'll replace that with forgiveness for you and for everybody else. Even you know who? Uh, all the rudeness will re be replaced with gentleness. All the slavery will be replaced with self-control. Can't you see Jesus jumping up and down on his toes saying, hey, I got something for you that <laughs> you can't imagine and it's going to be so wonderful that God is bringing on the earth and I'm going to tell you about it if you'll have faith in me. Slavery, habits, appetites, and others, self-control. And then, he, and then, he, then he, he brings this stuff called forgiveness. You're forgiven. <laughs> I'll be with you to help you with it. You can't do it by yourself, but I'll help you. Jesus is just bubbling. He's just going on because it's so absolutely wonderful. You're forgiven. My, my blood covers your sin, covers other sins against me. I'll break it down and make it two, two commandments. Love God with all your heart, my soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. When you do that, it takes care of all those others. And then he says stuff like, follow me. <laughs> I went down to Carlsbad Cavern one time. That place is dark. <laughs> Even with the lights on, it's dark. And I was scared. They turned those lights out. I needed somebody to follow. Jesus said, uh, just follow me. You don't have to know where I'm going. You don't have to know what's going to happen. You don't have to understand. You don't have to know all that stuff. All you need to do is follow me. Isn't it great to have somebody that's patient enough to say, Okay, Randy, you're lagging behind. You're forgetting what you've been preaching. You talk a good show, big boy. But when the... Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brenda. She reminded me that. She said, you know, you ought to hear what my preacher's been preaching. <laughs> <laughs> she started to act like a larpenter, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah was starting to starting to understand it. He didn't get it all right, but he was starting. Let me read a little of this. See, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever. 
in what I will create. Be glad and rejoice for a little while. No, no, forever for what I will create. I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will create, I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. Never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days, an old man who does not live out his years, one who dies at a hundred will be thought as a mere child. One who fails to reach a hundred will be considered a curse. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruits. No longer will they build houses and other people live in them. No longer will the other they plant and others eat. For as a day for the days of a tree, for as a day of tree, so will the days of my people be the days of my people, my chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands they will not labor in vain nor will they bear no will they bear children doomed to misfortune for they will be called a people blessed by the lord they and their descendants with them before before they call i will answer and while they're still speaking, I will hear. The, wa the wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like an ox. The dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all of my mountains, says the Lord. Then John the Revelator wraps it up in John in Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. First heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I looked that up. The big boys say that is no longer any danger. I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And that's to earth. That's to earth. Prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I saw and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling is now among his people and he will dwell with them they will be his people and god himself will be with them and will be their god he will wipe every tear from our eyes there will be no more death no more crying no more pain for the old order of things has passed away he who has seated on the throne said i am making everything new and he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Now, friends, let me tell you something. That's a do-over. That's another, another life to live. We miss Aunt Elle, but just for a little while. But her life isn't over. <laughs> she just graduated. Graduated to God's new world. I don't know when and where or how that's going to happen, but I'm following Jesus. So my ambition is to follow him closer, to learn more about him, to learn how to live and how to forgive, because that's the only way we can live together a minute, a month, a millennial, is to love, live, and forgive. Here and there, here and now, and there and then as well. So... What does he want us to do? He wants us to enjoy the life with Jesus right now. Just as we were intended to live in the first place. Together? Forever. Amen. Over today. I didn't time it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't time it. You don't want people talking. Yeah, I'm going to let, I'm going to open up for people to talk. Um, we, Aunt Sue is going to go first, though. That's, that's the only rule. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, I'm going to, um, we'll just go for a bit. Um, I don't, I'm not, there's not so many of us will be here for hours, so <laughs> I'm not going to worry about that. And then we'll just end with a song and a prayer. Um, so I'm just kind of, so we, we, here comes somebody, it may not be Aunt Sue though. <laughs> is it my turn yet? Yes, it is. It is. It is. <laughs> 
Or a wheelchair I found. Get on the airplane first on Southwest. It's wonderful. <laughs> but I don't like to be on the airplane, but I did because that's all the way you can get anywhere. So that's what I did. I hope you can hear me. Is it off? It's all on. Okay. Well, I'll talk right at it. I hear you. If you'll pull that up. Yeah. Oh, I'll get it. Yeah. Kenny is a good idea. <laughs> Eleanor had the loud voice. I did not. Uh, she had, a lot, she had a lot of things that I did not have. Um, she had a lot more fun than I had. Um, she, she had a lot more life experiences than I had in some ways. But some of the ones she had, I got to enjoy with her, and we did them together. And um, because this has been, um, this has been a really difficult journey. I'm not going to cry. I'm going to fall. <laughs> but anyway, um, she was one of those people that when they leave this world, there's a big whoosh. And they leave a big hole. And some of us will leave and people say, oh, yeah, that was nice, you know. But uh, there are others that, and she was one of those that uh, she didn't walk into a space that she didn't leave her footprints. And... But, and when she walked in, that's when the laughter began. And uh, uh, she was, so let me tell you a little bit. We had an older brother and sister who were twins, Jane and Jerry. And you know them. But you didn't know that Eleanor was part of a triplet. She had a sister named Mary, then Eleanor, and then Jenny. And they were 18 months apart. So they were like triplets, and uh, Mom used to dress them sometimes alike. <laughs> no. Unfortunately, the dress did not carry over into adulthood, but, uh, but the closeness carried over. And so even in these latter, later years, uh, she was on the, after she went back to Houston, she was on the phone with Jimmy at least every day, right, Juliet? She was on the phone. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and, uh they would ask me, well, did you talk to Mary Jane? You know, so <laughs> making sure Mary Jane was included in that. Uh, so then they're the triplets, and I come along about four years later, and I really ultimately was an only child because they didn't want me involved in anything. Those three did not want me involved. So I proceeded to take over Mom is my mother, and they better not interfere with it. So if I'm bossy, that's the reason I had to survive. And, um, and I don't remember much about Eleanor in our growing up. Again, I guess because I, I was sort of on a different path uh, than they were. And uh, I got a lot of attention uh, from the older kids, but also from my mom. And it impacted me in a most positive way. Um, but I remember working with her. She worked at a department store called Hotard and Good, and it was the upscale department store in our little town. And I worked there for a short while. But what I loved to do was borrow her clothes. She <laughs> took very good care of her clothes, meticulous care, as she did of her house and everything else. And so she occasionally would allow me to borrow them. Occasionally I would borrow without permission. And she did not like that at all because I did not take care of my things the way she did. I still don't even. So anyway, uh, I knew her during that time. and um, But I have a lot of other strong memories as I grew older. And one of those was when she married a friend and they lived in Baton Rouge and they had a four-year-old child. 
toddler called Glenn. And Glenn, uh, uh, I impacted his life mainly by teasing him a lot. <laughs> and Eleanor spent the same time dressing him as she did with herself. So everything had to be just so. Well, he had a lovely little uh, robe. And he's four years old, and he'd kind of have it haphazardly tied around him. And underneath, I could see shorts. And so I'd say, Glenn, a lady, I see your drawers. <laughs> <laughs> and it probably until before he died, we still had that lady in the drawers. So that was a good time. I was in graduate school. Eleanor was a stay-at-home mom, and she took care of everything. I never had to wear my clothes. And she was helpful. Hannah, as my mom had labeled her years before that. And um, that was a really good time in my life. Then she moved to Houston, and while Glenn was really small, I went out to visit. But I wasn't there very long, and I got a summons. Now, I'm the youngest single uh, three, they think. Uh, so they call me because Mary, the older one, had a baby named Terry. And <laughs> I needed to be there to help take care of Terry. So that was one of my first memories of ba bathing a tiny little baby. I came from Houston on a train so I could take care of Terry during that time. Um, so after I left the area, I went away to school, then I married, moved to California in 1970. Uh, I guess it was pretty sporadic. So not sporadic in that every Thanksgiving, I hauled myself back to Punchatoula for a family reunion. <laughs> and I missed probably 20, 20, 25 years, maybe one or two times when I didn't come back. So um, that was that was some special memories for all of us during that time. And I think you see some of that as a result. This is a result of that incredible closeness with first cousins. Uh, it, it's so wonderful. Um, so she and I both had a lot of life changes. And she visited me quite a few times out in California. And um, in fact, I remember one trip we took, we went to Napa. She had her first taste of wine at the Sterling Vineyard. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I mean, it was quite an experience. Um, so anyway, uh, let me catch my thought. So we get, uh, a little bit later, we did travel together. And uh, those things come to mind, the travel. And this is not necessarily in order. But uh, she and I took a cruise out of Galveston on one of those little short cruises to Mexico. Had a lovely time, saw the ruins there, and uh, we were good travelers with each other. Just whatever we wanted to do, we did. And then we took a big trip <coughs> to Paris. And I had made arrangements for a riverboat trip. But I signed up too late, as I have a tendency to procrastinate. I signed up too late, so I had to make my own arrangements in Paris for the two of us. And so we did that. We stayed at a wonderful little boutique hotel, and we toured Paris on foot most of the time. We probably walked 10 miles. I just can't. We walked everywhere, and we walked along and said, oh, there's a saloon. <laughs> I didn't know it was here, right there. <laughs> so that's how we toured Paris, and we hit all the high spots with Paris. Then we had to find our way um, on the train to get to take the riverboat cruise. And um, that was quite an experience. And here uh, I'm trying to use a little bit of French that I knew, which was very little after college and didn't have Carol there with me. She should have been there with us and toured us so we could have talked to people. So anyway, we, we get on the train. It's about a three hour, and that's a new experience. I mean, I don't do trains. I don't do buses. You know, I do cars. <laughs> and um, so anyway, um, we, we did that, and she's giving me a very hard time about my not, lack of not really French. She said, they don't understand you. What are you trying to do? <laughs> silly. They don't understand. She's giving me a really hard time. I said, well, we're getting from point A to point B, aren't we? <laughs> so, it's enough. It's all, it, it was just enough. Um, so then, that was part of that Paris trip. She made friends, as she did with everybody. She made friends with these two women from New York. And they were kind of hilarious, like she is hilarious. And, um, 
so anyway, um, no matter where we went, she made friends. And we did a lot of wineries. Of course, by this time, she's pretty experienced, so it's not, <laughs> not the same problem. <laughs> and then in 2018, I came out, and we did what I called our Thelma and Louise trip. <laughs> so her car was, she didn't think our car would make it. So we rented a car. I'm going to drive. My name is on the contract. So I think I'm going to drive. <laughs> she backseat drove so badly. I pulled over to AAA and got her, signed up for AAA so I could get her on the contract. And then I turned the drive in over to her. Uh, it, it would have been horrendous. Yes. No. So anyway, we started on that trip. We did 1,800 miles. We went to Waco, the two of us. Well, I'm into decorating and all this good fun stuff. You know, she wasn't too enthralled with us, but we were staying in a comfort hotel across from Magnolia Restaurant, and I wanted to go to Magnolia Restaurant. That's what you do when you're there. 7.30 in the morning, she said, I'm not getting up for breakfast. <laughs> I said, well, you can stay here. I'm going. So 7 o'clock in the morning, I had breakfast in Magnolia. And the night before, I tried to get her to go out a, a restaurant right across the street from it. Oh no, I'm tired. I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I go get takeout and bring it back. <laughs> so that was kind of our relationship. She she really directed things. Yeah. I, acted, I acted like I was in charge, but I never was in charge. <laughs> uh, so we did that whole trip. We stopped at places along the way, broke Ridge, and had good crawfish. And then we stopped in Baton Rouge, and we saw. Cecile in Denham Springs, and then we headed over to Biloxi, Mississippi. And of course, they have the big casinos there. And <laughs> one of my cousins from Alabama came over to meet us. He met me at the hotel, and uh, where well, the casino, rather. She was, and she liked to gamble, but she did not want to go out at that time of the night. So I go and meet him, have this wonderful dinner down there. And uh, <laughs> then we get back in the car, we head back to Punchachua and then come back here, 1,800 miles. So I made her a little travel uh, brochure, or not a brochure, but a booklet of the trip and called it Bell and Louise. Louise. <laughs> so that was really, uh, really a special time. And we had a lot of those special times, you know, as uh, we were traveling. Um, so, um, so in April of this year, Last year, April, uh, Dana and the three big kids, I call them her, so, sort of her pre-adult kids, but they were, they were mostly adult. Uh, in fact, Jaron wanted to make sure he asked the pastor at the big church that I went to, was drinking okay? What was, was wrong with drinking? <laughs> so, uh, we, we really had a good time for a long weekend. And then they left, and the reason they had come out with her, she did not like to fly, so they flew out with her, but she was brave enough to go back by herself. So she stayed a little extra with me. And during that time, uh, my hairdresser, who was 45 minutes away, came over and on my deck did her hair, uh, cut her hair. And she, that was when she was struggling with this hair and wore her wig. So uh, I thought it happens to her, I wear her wig today. Um, so she stayed, and then we had, I had some of my friends over for a meal, for dinner. They still would ask me, oh, we loved her stories, we just loved her story. How is Ellen? What's going on? This was before we lost her. And um, they still, they're just hilariously laughing about her stories. They know all, all of her stories, because she tells them all with such um, interest. And I don't want to steal anybody else's thunder, but um, there were some really unique stories. And any of you, and I might tell it differently because I think sometimes she told them differently. So, <laughs> when you have, it's because I got the original version. So. Anyway, one was her Home Depot. You know, as Dana said, she worked at Home Depot. Loved that job. She just loved that job. But she was the unofficial security person. It, really made her angry when people stole from Home Depot. And a couple of things that she did to try to keep an eye on them, and I keep saying, Eleanor, you shouldn't do that. You're not paid to do that. Somebody's going to hurt you. Don't do that. Didn't matter. <laughs> one of her tricks, she, she would see a family come in with a baby stroller, 
covered nicely to protect the baby, she would go up to them and say, Oh, let me see your baby. <laughs> There's no baby in there. There's a tools or something there. Take it out the back door. I'll be on this watch. She made sure they did not steal on her watch. And, um, and then the other one, and Julia was reminding me of this one, that um, people come in there and, oh, Home Depot, you know, this is no good. You should see what Lowe's has. And I can get that at Walmart and all that. She would say, oh, well, that's nice. She said, well, let me tell you what to do. You see that door? Go out that door, take a left, and about a block or two blocks down, you're going to find Lowe's. And you go in there, and you buy what you need from Lowe's. She did it really nicely. No, no uncertain terms. She was telling them, go. <laughs> Shovel. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, there's so, there so many other ones. Well, one of my fun ones I was reminded of before I came here, my husband, the time came out, and he loved Eleanor, and Eleanor loved him. I had to keep an eye on him. <laughs> they loved each other so much. Uh, but anyway, he was having problems with wax in his ears, and we'd heard about this thing that you could do wax in the ear. So Eleanor and I in her tiny little kitchen are doing the treatment on him with this. And he was so good, he just let us do anything. So <laughs> she got to be pretty good about that. Um, uh, but the last time I was here, in November, I came out, Dana asked me to come, and, and I was going to come anyway, but I came sooner, um, to help them move her from a one-bedroom to a, a, a independent living at Paradise Springs. So we did that, and that was a very painful process. And you go home and look at your stuff and see what you'd be willing to give up or have someone else just make a decision about it that you don't even know what's happening with it. So we did that, got her moved to this new place called Paradise Street. I fell in love with the place. Now she was recovering a little bit, a little stronger. In fact, I stayed a week, slept on her sofa, Dana and Anthony had set up her lovely little room and it was very comfortable and um, she seemed to be pretty content there. She was very interested in what was going on. And so uh, she moved in on a Wednesday. The gen this gentleman moved in on a Monday. His name was Bob. And I made contact with Bob, talked to him. And he was interesting and he was upright and uh, <laughs> not in his behavior. <laughs> so he was upright. So I thought, this is a good contact, right? Somebody that she can talk to because she likes to talk. He liked to talk. And so we're sitting in the living area and just sitting there kind of maybe waiting for the next meal. I don't know. And then along comes Bob. And so Bob's standing there, starts to chat with us. Eleanor's not too interested, but I said, Oh, Bob, this is my sister. Why don't you sit here and talk to her? I have some errands to do. So I talked to her with him, and then I ran off for 20, 30 minutes. I don't know how long I was gone. I came back. She was so furious with me. She jumped up, and she said, I'm ready to go. And, she, and we walked away. And she said, Bob says he's a hugger, and I told him I am not a hugger. <laughs> She dashed my hopes that I was going to have somebody. And he had a little doll. She would have made him more interested. But, uh, anyway, um, she, um, had, so that was quite a week. And she was really getting a little stronger. And I, was, I, was, I worked so hard with transitions for her so she would meet some other people. There were some very interesting people there. And we would eat a meal with a different person every day. So she would get to know people, and and I encouraged her to go, you know, just go and sit by somebody else, and and she did that. In fact, I uh, well on a Sunday, and we were going to go to church, and she they had chapel there. She didn't want to go to chapel there, so uh, Dana and Anthony offered to come and get us and take us to church, and she said, "Well, I'm not going." I said, "Well, okay, you stay here. I'm going." And so when I came back, and she was in bed, I think, when I left her, I came back. It was scary. She got herself up, dressed, 
lots of makeup, all of her creams that she used, her beauty creams that she got from Marshall. She kept a little <laughs> drawer. <laughs> you want to ask her about her nice skin? It's made in my beauty drawer. And, and she did that for years. She took very good care of herself. And so I came back, she was dressed, and she had gone down for the meal and had uh, been talking to people. And after that, she still was trying to go down and meet different people. And she was sitting with different, I said, just, just go sit down. It's in the empty chair. Boy, what are they going to do? They're not going to run you away. <laughs> so she, she was doing that. So I felt when I left that, uh, that she was going to, to be great. But the last gift I, I'd say she gave me was, um, it's okay. Okay. the last gift she gave me was the realization of how, sh how short life is and how, how fragile it is and that you don't take anything with you. You don't. You, nothing. Nothing is of value when you get to this age. Nothing. Only the people you love and your relationship with God. Nothing else is valuable. And so as a result of that, and I need somebody to go get that basket on the, on the, it's a basket. Sandy probably, I mean, uh, Cecile was no it is. So as a result of that, I went back home to California, and I'm a, it's not junk, it's a collection I have. And, um, and it made me really realize, I've got too much stuff. I've got stuff everywhere. So I began to declutter, and I basically decluttered everything down to my she shed. And my she shed is still um, pretty full. It's not too stuff. So the she shed is pretty full. And uh, I started to declutter, and I was not getting very far. So I began to pray about it, because what, what are my kids going to have to deal with all this stuff that's mostly from goodwill anyway. So I don't buy, buy valuable things. So as a result of that, one of the things, yeah, I did, you going to help me, so one of the things I did was um, start looking at my stuff. And I realized that when I go on a trip, you can't take much back with you. I would always buy a tea towel, right? So I looked in my closet. I, I lost count. There were at least 30 tea towels, maybe more. And so I had a, I have a women's group I meet with every couple of months, and we do a little devotion or whatever, nothing big. So uh, I thought, well, I, this is a good chance to get rid of some things. But before that, I had a garage sale, and I laid out a lot of stuff for a garage sale, and I uh, emailed some friends and some other people to come, come to my garage sale. And it's free. Anything you want. It's free. So I got rid of almost everything I put out. One gentleman down the street came and took two boxes, and I thought, three boxes. I said, are you going to use all that? And then I thought, why do I care? I'm getting rid of it. Even my clothes, it's all this stuff. So anyway, as a result of that um, dinner with my friends, where we had this little exercise um, with Bible scriptures, relating to not holding on to stuff to really remind us that um, it's so it's so useless for the most part so you and i love all that stuff i have to tell you <laughs> but anyway as a result i got rid of a lot of them and then i thought whoa i have a captive audience in, <laughs> in texas so what am i going to do i'm going to get rid of some more stuff okay so as a result uh we we'll start with the Niece, the nieces, and Chris is going to go around. You can reach in there, pull out. And don't look. Some are better than others. I promise. Some may even have a little spot on them, uh, but they, they've been hanging on my stove. So, uh, so all the nieces take one, and then we'll come back to Mary Jane and Juliet, the sisters-in-laws, and then I think we have some enough to. Where Susan and Sue Rapsil, two Rapsilver and Susan, we may even have enough for that. And uh, so thank you very much for helping me declutter. Now, uh, I got to go home and think about the rest of the stuff. Sam doesn't know it. He's going to have a point in that. <laughs> it's the price of living with Sue. <laughs> that is Ann. Sue. <laughs> uh, it's the price of that. And Sam has been with me since September, and it's 
It's been a unique pleasure to have him. I've told him and his mom, I love having him as a nephew, being his aunt. I'm not much good at being his landlady because <laughs> I have been a tough landlady over the years and I don't know how to back off of that. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, he's, he's been a delight. He's good company in Aberran. It's nice to have a man around when you need to pick up something or whatever that, that I don't have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> an hour to do yard work or whatever. You know. Anyway, um, it's just been really great. So we'll, we'll pass it around and thank you so, so much for letting me talk to you and letting you be Eleanor for a day. I, I have to tell you, I have never, ever grieved over anything or anybody the way I have with her. Um, we, were, we were closer than I knew. Uh, we, over the years, have had, so, you know, I'm such a doer and let's fix it or whatever. That's my mode. But we've had some Super. really good conversations over the years of uh, the pains we've experienced, the joys we've experienced. And um, I, I feel a, a great big hole when you're gone. But I'm so happy for her. And my friend Lois keeps reminding me, well, she's not suffering so good, you know. <laughs> so thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. And I hope I can make many more trips. <laughs> uh, so for more stories, if you must want to share a story or a humorous memory of... Scarecrow! Of Eleanor? Oh, I do. Oh, we'll do Kathleen and then Rodney. <laughs> um, relating to Anne Elmer and Nancy being together, I don't know, most of you know that they had an older brother named Richard who had a son named Dick. And over the years, just you know, when he was little, lost contact with him. And in later years, he was able to come back and see the family and... He told me one day that Ann Eleanor and Aunt Sue took him around and showed him all the places they used to live. And he said they were like clowns <laughs> in the car. He said they laughed and they had so much fun. I thought, like, oh, I want to be there. Because they, like she said, they were very close and um, they were very compatible, though different. The other thing is that I had the distinction of being Ann Eleanor's mini me. Um, as my mother would point out to me all the time, you look just like Eleanor and you act like her too. <laughs> I don't know if that was a compliment, the part about the acting. <laughs> I ate slowly <laughs> and uh, did things rather slowly and she saw that as being, you know, if you knew my mom, she did nothing slow. Uh, so that was, that was why she called me Eleanor. So I, I will keep that as a good memory. <laughs> well, you met Eleanor many me. I'm Sue's <laughs> many. And I know when Mama said, call me Sue, she was not doing it out of a lot of my good behavior. <laughs> but anyway, I love Dane L. Any time she was around, it was a lot of fun. I used to think, hey, Eleanor was born a hundred years too late. She could have been in charge of Pinkertons. <laughs> in the old West. Uh, and one of the other fun uh, memories I had of her, she had the first Mustang, Ford Mustang, that oh, I have ever okay. seen. She brought it to Pachatula. And I thought, oh, if I'm ever rich enough, I'm going to get a Mustang. <laughs> <laughs> Never got that rich. <laughs> she uh, let us ride in it. Rodney's uh -huh. <laughs> coming. <laughs> Yeah. Does anybody here not know who I am? <laughs> Randy. Randy. <laughs> well, I'm Rodney. I was 
I'm a nephew of Ain Elder, and I'll tell you all the story about Ain Elder in her later years. <laughs> she lived over in Louisiana for I don't know it was two, two, yes, year, two yeah, years, yeah, a year or two something, or something, something in my mom and dad's backyard, and we have a boat, and so we would invite her to go out with us, not knowing that how nautical she was. <laughs> and anytime we would call and ask, hey, no, are you want to be going to go on a boat tomorrow? You want to go? Sure, what time? You know, she, she would come, and, and so we would take her out on the boat. But this one particular time, we had a crew. You know, I had my mom and dad, and Ann Eleanor, and my mother-in-law, and that way. Yeah, I think that's about how many years. I was on that trip. And soon? And soon. Maybe. I don't know. You were on the town when it was really rough. We were on different times. So, so we decided to take the three-hour tour <laughs> and, and go over to Madisonville and eat at a restaurant and come back that day. So as we proceed across Lake Marfall, do the South Pass, and get in the Lake Pontchartrain, the wind was blowing in a different direction, and Lake Pontchartrain was extremely rough. And the boat's 41 foot long, but it was probably six foot seas. <laughs> and so as we start out into the lake, I mean, I have no problem. The boat's going to make it, but what about the crew? <laughs> so I started getting real wet on the top, trying to drive for a fly bridge. So I said, well, let me go down inside and just drive from inside. So as I come down... I didn't understand the chaos that was going on inside the boat until I come in the back door. And Aunt Eleanor was screaming. The boys, we're going to sink, we're going to sink. <laughs> and, uh, and then she looks and sees me coming in the door, in the back door, and she's like, don't try the door. <laughs> I said, it's fine, calm down, calm down. And, and she was hanging on, like people hanging on, screaming at her. What do y'all think? Should we just go back? You know, just go turn around and go back home. And they said, yes, let's go back home. We're going to have to endure an hour of this rough seas to get where we're going. <laughs> so we go back home. And I said, oh, I told my wife, I said, I think we were ruined. Ain't Eller is never going to go back home. <laughs> She's very resilient. Yeah. And so I think even maybe the next weekend we call her and say, Ain't Eller, we're going on the boat. Sure, what time? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she never looked back, and I thought for sure yeah. she would never get in the boat again. But she, she did. You <laughs> see, every time you taught her how to drive it. <laughs> we, had, we had a great time with her while she was over there. It was really fun. I mean, miss her a lot. So. Oh, Julia. Oh, oh. oh. No, oh, we all know the family, but face the other way. <laughs> but anyway, um, I just I don't. There's a lot of things I could say. But she lived in my backyard in a little house for probably about a year and a year and a half, maybe something. Like that. something. But anyway, every morning when I woke up. She was in my house, <laughs> sitting in the living room, and her and Sipin were drinking coffee every morning. And I could li I listen to see what they were talking about, because, I mean, she was right over toward Sipin, and they were just talking away. They were talking about olden days and people they knew years ago. And Randy called me one time to see who's, how somebody was kin. I said, oh, my goodness, Randy, I don't know. You're going to have to call... Because Eleanor's gone now, and Jimmy, yeah. mm -hmm. they, they had this information here. Mm -hmm. And I said, you had to call one of the other family members, because I've been told, but I don't remember. <laughs> but I really enjoyed doing things with her, yeah. go shopping. and mm -hmm. But the thing that stands out is she was always in my house the next morning. When Jimmy <sighs> got up, he went and unlocked the back door. Because he knew she was coming as soon as she saw the light. She watched to see the light so she could come over. And uh, we had a lot of good shopping times. San Sandy was there for a while living. And uh, we did really good. And 
But uh, that was really funny, though, the boat ride. Oh, <laughs> that's that's I can imagine. Imagine. Her eyes were this big around. <laughs> she was panicking. <laughs> we were trying to keep her calm. But, um, <laughs> I was a little bit uneasy, too, but, but I, was, I wasn't scared like she was. But uh, I was trying to think. There was something else I was going to say, and it's just out of the But anyway, we love Danielle, and I talked to her even... After yeah. she had passed away, I talked to her quite mm -hmm. a bit on the phone, and I enjoy talking to her. And the last time I talked to her, I think, was just the week before she moved into that okay. little uh, yeah. place. And uh, and we never talked that long, but this time we talked 45 minutes. Wow. And I thought, wow, we talked a long time today. And I, But I enjoy talking to her. And Sue, I always like to talk to Sue. Huh. And Sue were more listening to age. Sue. <laughs> <laughs> you listening to Sue. To Sue. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, we love Danielle and we enjoy yeah. having her around. Thank you. Thank you. I just, thank you so much. Y'all did that. I let her say there. That was a good, good for her before you did it. Yes, it was. It was good. I am Krista. I am Sue's daughter. Um, so I am Aunt Eleanor's baby niece. Number 35. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. we're right there, mid 30s. Um, for, in the, in number the, 35. I'm number 35. Yeah. You're 34. Yeah. That's, That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> um, and even though we were so far away growing up in California, Family has always been such a priority and being able to spend time and coming every summer or coming during Thanksgiving. Mom always made sure that we were there and it was so embracing to be part of this remarkable family that I feel so grateful to be part of. And Aunt Eleanor, it was there was always laughing and carrying on and commotion. It was never never quiet and reserved. And so much of that with my aunts and uncles and cousins, but Aunt Eleanor's laugh really just bringing everybody together and through it and, and just really funny. I have a lot of stories. Mom stole my uh, Home Depot story. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, but she, it's been nice because the last handful of years she's been able to come out and get to know my family, and I've gotten to know her so much as well as an adult. I would say one of my favorites are two stories. So we did, Mom had talked about going to Napa, and we had to take a gondola up to the mountains, this vineyard, and Aunt Eleanor, true to form, we're taking pictures, and she's like, I want all the empty wine glasses in front of me, and take a picture of me with all of them. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God, he is too much. <laughs> Very unpredictable, always a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and then the second one, she was telling my husband, Jeremy, and I, and Jeremy just re had, redid it. He did it in Aunt Eleanor's voice. He did the impression <laughs> recently. But she had told us a story, and I, I have I'm, some of the details wrong, I'm sure, but I remember that. She had a hamburger. There was oh. hamburger and fries. Uh, and she was taking her garbage she out. She was taking the garbage out. And the hamburger and fries landed in the garbage. It was her lunch. It was her lunch. <laughs> so she needed to, what am I going to do? I got to go in and get it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> she went in to get it. She's like, dumpster. In the dumpster. In the big dumpster. In the, in the big dumpster. Now, was it her second time? She, she threw her keys in. Oh, my God. <laughs> so she would like to dumpster dump. She had no problem dumpster dump. <laughs> the problem was, the problem was she couldn't get out. <laughs> so she had to stay there until someone came by. <laughs> she was like stacking up trash, trying to get out. She couldn't get out. <laughs> Her escape plan. Yes. She was so she was so funny. She was so original. Her humor clearly like within her family yes. with Dana and the kids, the whole family. Um, and I just feel really blessed and fortunate to have had such a, a, a wonderful aunt and to have such an incredible family here that I love deeply. So thank you. Thank you to our aunts and uncles. 
um, to Aunt Julia and Uncle Jimmy for always hosting and fostering and, and to our wonderful family. Anybody else? Hi, I'm Holly. I have been a good friend of Dana for about 40 years. We met um, freshmen in high school, and I wanted to say just a couple of things. One, I, like Sue, used to borrow Eleanor's clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we for Model United Nations because um, you know little suits and, and jackets and stuff were not in our high school wardrobe. But <laughs> it was always really fun to go clothes shopping in her closet. Yes. <laughs> but I wanted to say that you know growing up south of Houston, the female role models I had were, were teachers and stay-at-home mothers, and I include my my mom. She was she was both at different times, but. The example that Eleanor gave me, kind of working as she did in, in corporate America, was very enlightening for me. That I, I learned a lot about business just listening to her stories. Mm -hmm. You know, it was around the dining table or mm -hmm. just hanging out in the living room in the apartment. And I really looked up to her as someone who was a professional woman. And that was an example I didn't really have outside of her. And so the very fond memories of just spending time with her and Dana as a kid, just absorbing everything she said. Hi, uh, I'm Andrew Larpenter, so I'm Rodney's son and Juliet's grandson, so just trying to keep that lineage up here. <laughs> um, I, I really loved Ann Eleanor. Um, like I said, she was very, very funny, very feisty. Um, haven't heard too much of a mention about her temper, so I'm not going to tell you the story about her temper. Then. My, my defining memory of Ann Eleanor was when we were in. Uh, we had gone to Tennessee for one of my grandparents' anniversaries. And we were at the Dixie Stampede. Oh, and oh, yeah. In the little oh. pre-show area of the Dixie Stampede, you can get like one free beverage. <laughs> we, had, we must have had like 20 LARPers there. Yeah. So we had, we had this whole table dominated. And I was sitting right across from Aunt Eleanor. And Glenn was to her right. And the poor waiter comes out with the tray. It must have like 30, 35 <laughs> drinks on it trying to hand start handing them out to our table. And they were like these like smoothie style drinks, like cold and, and kind of slushy. And as he's trying to reach out and hand the drinks across the table, he's got the whole tray in his other hand and he starts to tip a little bit. And he starts leaking from the top of one of the glasses some of the slushy material right down Glenn's back. And Glenn jumps up and is like, whoa, and reacts. So then the waiter kind of stumbles to the left a little and a whole glass flips off his tray and lands upside down in Aunt Eleanor's purse. <laughs> just, just upside down her purse. It, it didn't spill a drop on the way down. Just upside down her purse, into her purse and empties inside her purse. And she was furious. And I'm sitting across from him. I saw the whole thing. Front seat, not a, not a drop on me. Aunt Eleanor pulls that cup out and throws it and right at me. <laughs> I get smoothie slushy on my shirt. I was, I, was, I was clean. I had avoided the first barrage. She, she just in her anger threw that cup as a reaction and got me covered in slushy. And I, that, that was so funny to me. I, I like that story a lot. Like demanded. Oh, and there was all sorts of weird funny stuff that happened after that. She, she went off. But, but I was just, I was just right there. I was sitting across. I mean, these are little like one foot wide table. That was kind of like like a bar top almost. That you could sit on each side. So I saw the whole thing right there. And I was in the splash zone of the, of the after shots. I wasn't part of the original place. So yeah. um, Oh yeah, they reimbursed her for the cost of the purse too or something like that. How much? hundred. She didn't pay that for that purse. Oh, she didn't pay that for that purse. She got it at bar school. She got it at bar school.
<laughs> one last thing real quick. It was really funny to see uh, Aunt Sue and Aunt Eleanor's wig uh, coming out here. Um, because, and this isn't my story, but I think there was a time at Thanksgiving when Aunt Eleanor was in a little conversation circle talking to people, and Aunt Sue had kind of walked by, and Aunt Eleanor said, you know, between the two of us, you really could tell that Sue was the younger one. I looked younger, you know? <laughs> 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 With all the skincare routine and the hair. Yeah, 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 so then to see Aunt Sue out here in Eleanor's wig, I was like, oh, Eleanor looks younger now. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Trump card to tell one final story about Eleanor. Uh, Come on. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the oldest of the Spindler grandchildren, the second. So, the, the thing about Eleanor uh, when young age is that she was the woman that taught me Southern hospitality. And that uh, whenever it was, uh, I remember one particular moment, uh, we were going to visit her one day as kids. It's been about 10 or 11. We hit that Houston traffic, you know, on the bridge going south on the Bellway. And we got there late, so late. Sun was down, it must have been 9, 10 o'clock, I don't know. But I walked in that door and there was a plate of hot pancakes, maple syrup, bacon. She had a smile on her face and a joke to tell. And I left there, I had a bag of Willow's Originals in my pocket. And I'm sure she would have given me the show off her back if I had asked. But uh, it just taught me just uh, that any person in your home is a guest, and what yours is theirs. Mm -hmm. And it just it's a wonderful attitude to have about life. It is. And so I just want to give out a play of Thanksgiving um, and a blessing to all of us as we go eat today. The Lord, thankful, I don't know what, and the wonderful life she led, that she's happy in your arms now. And I pray that all of us here will carry her memory with us as we go about our lives. That you bless the food we're about to eat and the company that we're about to be. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, we can be done and all hands on deck. <laughs> <laughs>